But when you find out at 10 weeks that you're having twins and your doctor isn't an expert in breech delivery and about half of all twins at term, at least one of the babies will be breech, that doctor should tell you, you know what? You've got twins. I'm not an expert in twins. You should go see somebody else. But that's not what they do. They lie. They just say, oh, Mm. twins, you're going to be, we're going to probably induce you or schedule your C-section at 37 weeks. They don't tell them why. They they throw out the risks of stillbirth, the dead baby thing that you've talked about. The, these things are not honest. They're just not honest. Stu Fishbein. Nathan Riley. One of my earliest mentors. You're back on. You're back on the show. Thanks, Nathan. It's good to be back, actually. It's good to see you. Yeah. It's good to see you. You, ma- you recently made the move from California, which has become a very hard place to live and practice for people like me yep. and you to the glorious state of Utah. How is that for you? It's uh, glorious is a decent word. It's um, it's a it's culture change for sure. I mean, I'm in a very small town. My town has two stoplights in it. And everything is at least no more than six to seven minutes away. And it's very nice. And I went to the DMV yesterday and I was able to register all three of my cars in less than an hour. Uh, I was first, I was, oh, every wow. time I came back with a different car, I was still first in line because there was nobody else there. <laughs> uh, so what city are you in, Kanab, in Utah? Uh, Kanab, Utah. It's in Southern Utah. It's about 30, 30 miles from Zion Canyon and about uh, 60 miles from Bryce and maybe 80 from the Grand Canyon and an hour west of Lake Powell. It's really kind of a hub for summer tourist season. Yeah. Uh, but it's very sweet here. Uh, it's the pace is much slower. I don't know a lot of people here yet, but I was never that social in LA anyway. Pro- partially because I just never really had time. I was always yeah. being pulled in different directions. So it's very nice not being on call, and I'm having more time for reading and writing and consulting. I do like you. I do a lot of stuff on Zoom or online, um, and yeah. setting up. Uh, seminars for next year. I'm looking forward to seeing you in August. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you listening who who haven't heard, um, Dr. Stu, along with Mila Chavira, one of my other mentors back from my Kaiser days, um, Rick Safries, David Hayes, uh, Betty Ann Davis, and Christine Lauria are all going to be joining um, Stu in Louisville for a Twins in Breach conference, which is actually going to be the topic of our conversation today, talking a little bit about informed decision making around these two catastrophic diagnoses when it comes to having a vaginal birth. And, um, you know, Twins Breach and, and maybe the, the other one is maybe a history of C-section. I, I would suspect, Stu, what percentage of people who have pursued you for a home birth have met one of those criteria over the past, let's say, five years. Before I answer that, I want kudos for that perfect setup that I gave you to lead into the promo for the uh, <laughs> August event. So, uh, dude, you are you are spot on. I with felt your like sex. I was Ed McMahon to you, Johnny Carson, but most of your listeners probably don't know who they, who those people are. So, um, most of my clients uh, are in that category. I would say. You know, 3% of, of term pregnancies are breech and about 3% of term pregnancies are twins. So that makes up about a 6%. The average OBGYN would probably have about 6% of their practice be twins or breeches. Mine was about about 48 to 50% of my practice was twins or breeches. Wow. At, at VBACs, you know, Nathan, I don't really I don't really look at VBACs in the same category. A lot of people bunch them up and they say VBAC, breech, and twins. But breach and twins, you know, as you know, requires some skill that a lot of our colleagues don't have. VBAC is just a normal vaginal delivery. And so I, you know, a lot of my breaches and twins are also VBACs, but a lot of my head down singletons are VBACs. But I don't really, I never really tallied them. I didn't really keep track of them after I wrote that first paper back uh, seven or eight years ago. I've sort of just considered VBAC to be a vaginal delivery. Yeah. Normal birth. Yeah. 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 I, and you know that I agree with you. It's it's that when clients are reaching out to me on a daily basis, worried because at some point in their OB care, they're basically being fired from the practice and they're they're out looking for somebody last minute because of either twins, breach, or history of C-section with, with breach. And now it's like there's two big red flags there through the lens of a strictly uh, well, through the lens of a system that thinks it's okay that 40% of babies come out through an abdominal you know, incision. Um, so the reality is, even though 
there should be very, very little concern around a history of C-section. A lot of our colleagues, these FACOGs, the fellow of ACOG, that, 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 um, that litter, um, they seem to be very, very concerned about this. What, what are they, I mean, I'm, another softball question, but like what, what, what is the okay. deal here for, for people listening that have no idea? What's up, everybody? It's Nathan, the host of your favorite podcast, the only OBGYN podcast that matters, the Holistic OBGYN podcast. So here's three things that you can do right now. Number one, if you like these episodes, if you like the show, share it with people you love. They're probably going to like it too. The second is to support our sponsors. I've aligned myself with brands that make the best, highest quality products out there, all pertaining to fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, parenting, you name it. Support them. Let them know that you're paying attention. And then third is that I want you to take a moment and click like. Let the Googleverse and the interwebs know that you're listening, that you're paying attention to the Holistic Obituary podcast. Believe it or not, this really, really, really matters. So it's so important that I'm just going to take a brief pause right now. I'm going to let you go and click that like button. So just don't mind me. I'm just going to wait. All right. You've done it. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think I've said enough. Let's get back to my conversation. Well, let's just let's specifically stick with VBAC for a second. Um, the deal is that hospitals are driven by financial motivation and they cherry pick which guidelines they wish to follow and which guidelines they don't wish to follow. So they're very inconsistent. Yeah. They're very hypocritical. And one of the guidelines ACOG used to have out was the immediately available emergency help guideline, which was part of their VBAC guideline. And in other words, it used to be readily available. And then sometime along the way, they changed it to immediately available. And eventually, they changed it sort of back. But that doesn't matter. When you change something back, if it's not advantageous to the system, they're going to ignore it. They're going to pick the cherry yeah. pick the thing. So the immediately available thing said that you have to have an anesthesiologist in house, you have to have an OR crew in the house, you have probably have to have a uh, laborist, which is you and I know that, but it's for your listeners, it's a person who works for the hospital or is working on a shift at the hospital and is delivering everybody who's on that 12 hour shift or whatever. So you have to have yeah. those people in house. That's what I was doing when I was still there. Probably 80% of hospitals in the country can't afford to do that. And so they just, they're administrative people who aren't looking out for the interests of the people that they care for. They'll say they are. They have a great PR department that talks about thriving and all that other stuff, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But um, I, I went to Kaiser. Their whole thing was thrive. That was the uh, that was where I did my residency. Was, every time I heard that commercial, it was like nails on a blackboard for me. But but well, the, the administration that's not their primary concern, and so they put out a, policies that make it either a ban, an outright ban on VBAC, or they make it difficult on the practitioner who would otherwise be happy to support a VBAC because it's just a vaginal birth. But they make a rule that says, well, if there's a VBAC in labor and it's yours, you have to be here. And no doctor really wants to spend 12 or 14 hours sitting around a hospital for the same amount of pay that they would have gotten if they would have sectioned her at 7.30 in the morning and been out by 8.15. So That's right. um, all the economic forces, all the expedient forces, some of the medical legal forces are all pushing people toward coming up with skewed counseling to get you to believe that VBACs are, are less safe than they really are. They're, they're very, very, they're, they're essentially not any riskier pretty much than any other delivery. And what they never talk about, of course, Nathan, you and I know this, is, is if you have a C-section and you want a vaginal delivery and they say, no, you can't have it, and you have a second C-section, they never ask you, right. um, do you want more children? Because the question of if you want more children is not something that they care about because, as you know, if you listen to me, the medical model only cares about that baby in the bassinet. And what happens in the future to right. that woman right. is sort of irrelevant to them. But if a woman wants a third baby or a fourth baby and she's had two C-sections or now three C-sections or whatever, each time she does that, she puts that baby at more risk and she puts herself at more risk because of the risk right. of scar dehiscence or the risk of... Uh, abnormally invasive placenta or what we call placenta accreta. So um, yeah. those risks get higher than the risk of rupture. If you look at uh, VBAC Facts website, you can see that. After two C-sections, the risk of accreta is higher than the risk of rupture. And 
and but they won't tell you that they don't because they mm. they they like I said they skew their counseling. It's very unethical. It's a complete violation of ACOG's ethical guidelines, which of course those guidelines are ignored uh, by by most hospitals and by most many OBs. And again, I'm not vilifying my individual colleagues who are OBs. Some of them need to be vilified, but most of them are just pawns in the system. They're just cogs in a wheel. Most right. of them are employees, and they're told what to do and how long they have to do it and how much they get paid to do it. And they've lost their autonomy. And once you lose your autonomy, it's human nature to lose your desire to satisfy that individual client. Right, right. So when a person has a C-section, we have longer recovery, we have delayed maternal neonatal bonding, we have greater risk of infection, greater risk of blood loss, et cetera. As you get to the second, third, fourth, fifth C-section, all of those risks go way up. Um, and and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just glazing over the risks. There's, there's quite a number of risks. And this will play well into the breach conversation too. But before we go on, you mentioned accreta. Can you explain for people what you're talking about with accreta, this accreta spectrum of, of plastic? Yeah, the uterus um, inner layer has a lining um, of cells that help, help the placenta attach but not invade. And nature, nature's brilliance. I mean, nature's design is just brilliant. And if we stop messing with it, we'd probably have better outcomes. But the medical model doesn't, you know, the medical model is designed to meddle. That's sort of what we're taught when we're trained. So that yeah. layer, when it's disrupted during a C-section, doesn't always heal right. And so there's a part of that layer that isn't there, or I, I, I can't exactly describe what happens. I don't know the cellular level of what's going on, but it doesn't heal correctly. And so if you get pregnant a second time, and if that placenta happens to implant over that part that was damaged, which would be the anterior lower uterine segment or the lower part of the uterus, where we made the the hysterotomy, where, where we there's a up. chance and an ever increasing chance to, with more C sections, but that placenta instead of growing to a point and then sort of stopping and exchanging vessels with the mom so that blood and nutrients can go back and forth, that placenta goes beyond that and starts to grow into the uterine wall, and it can grow into the uterine wall, which is an accreta. It can grow uh, through the uterine wall, which is a percreta. What's the other one? <laughs> I'm missing one. Oh, it would be it'd be a creta, yeah, increase increase into the uterine wall. Percreta is all the worst. way like, into the bladder or something else that's down there. Thanks right. for helping me right. out. Right. <laughs> I, I forgot sometimes. It's okay. Um, it's okay. I've got a couple more brain cells. I haven't uh, been on call Not as long quite. as you have. Yeah, you've got a few years life. to go. <laughs> but but I'm just saying. So that's really yeah. what happens. Yeah. And you know, it, uh, on a bigger theme, every time you mess with Mother Nature. There are ripple effects. There are downstream consequences. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary. And sometimes those consequences are something that's a part of life. But to think that we're going to give a woman an epidural or we're going to do a C-section or we're going to not let them eat in labor or we're going to put them on aspirin or we're going to do all these things. And there isn't any downside to doing those things or we're going to vaccinate them all at 28 weeks. Um, right. And there's no downside to that is, is, a, is a being foolish. You're you're a fool, and yeah. I and I and what's yeah. sad about to me is that most of organizational medicine, not just in obstetrics but in all medicine, are are staffed with people who are all stage one thinkers. They never think beyond yeah. the initial. Does it feel like I'm doing something good, as opposed to asking the question, does it actually do any good, and what are the downstream consequences yeah. of what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, just to go back briefly to the accreta conversation, when we diagnose that oftentimes what, ha you know, especially in creta per creta, the problem with this is it's not just, oh, that sounds bad. It often results in, I think it's the highest mortality surgery that is done anywhere in the hospital, but you end up doing a C-section, I'm sorry, a, a, a hysterectomy at the time of C-section, meaning you're not going to have any more kids in the future. And you have all the more comorbidities now associated, or all the morbidity, I should say, associated with having had a very, very high risk uh, procedure. A hysterectomy is a fairly easy procedure, except in pregnancy. And so they'll call in the gynonks, they call in multiple surgeons. You have to have the all the whole blood bank sometimes is 
is available to you um, and, and required to keep a person alive because you lose so much blood during these types of procedures. So this is not something to be toyed with. And if that risk is higher than the the dreaded uterine rupture, which again is less than 1%, it's 0.4 to 0.9% somewhere in there, um, we actually are, are predisposing our patients to greater harm by by not being a little bit more thoughtful about how we're recommending And beyond that things. even, Nathan, which is so, really, the points you made are really good, but we're talking about surgery in a level, a tertiary care hospital like Cedar sinai or one of your Kaisers, where they have all this stuff. Im- imagine the risk to a woman who, who is in third world country or in a small community hospital where they don't have a GYN oncologist there, or they don't have a blood bank that's available, or they don't have these things. Or in a third world country where the maternal mortality from cesarean sections are already high enough. You're talking about one in uh, the number I saw was one in 14 women who have a placenta per creta or in creta, or even a creta, are going to potentially die from that surgery. Again, no woman wow. has ever told that. When she says, you know, you've labored long enough, your baby's not tolerating labor well, probably because we've numbed you and we've overstimulated you with Pitocin, but, and so we're going to do a C-section on you and you'll be fine because it will be in and out in 30 minutes and it won't be a big deal. And that's- Yeah. You don't want your baby to die, do you? Let's yeah, just go and, and do the surgery. And they, but, the, yeah. but they're not talking about anything in the future. They're not giving somebody an option. They're so worried about the watch and the clock and, and how fast people are moving because the system is designed that way. And that's why you and I, having somehow been lucky enough to find the midwifery model of care, understand that, that there, a lot of things don't run on a clock. They don't, labor doesn't necessarily run on an algorithm, but hospitals do. Right. And that's why right. you, know, well, you and I are both advocates for trying to get women who have no problems or even minor problems to be not think that the hospital is their only option. That's right. Are you familiar with a lot of the history of midwifery, like with the Flexner report and everything? Um, what we're, I mean, what we're facing is this medical industrial complex that has effectively squashed out all, uh, uh, dissent whatsoever. And I think the midwives have posed a, a big threat to the medical industrial complex. Can you, you know, you've been doing this for way longer than I have. Can you speak a little bit to that? Not exactly the Flexner report and stuff like that. I'm really not familiar with that specifically, but I, you know, I, I obviously I've absorbed a lot of history of what's going on with midwifery from, you know, back in the twenties and, and whenever, when organized medicine began to vilify the granny midwives and, 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 um, try to sell the, you know, the modern medical thing as the great thing. And, and the midwives were, you know, witches and, and, you know, they, they were practicing a, right. an outbranded form of medicine of which it wasn't safe. And, you know, it was all propaganda. And, um, and then what's happened now is I've watched is that the medical profession has successfully overwhelmed the midwifery profession and convinced most Americans that midwifery is a lesser subset of obstetrics and they're not as qualified. And sometimes I listen to podcasts where people who don't know anything are talking about this topic and they say, well, you know, midwives only have like three years of training and they don't have this degree or that degree as if having a bunch of alphabets, letters behind your name makes you better at something than someone else. And it doesn't. But it, right. but um, it's interesting. God, there's so much we could talk about here, Nathan. I'm not going off on a tangent, so remember where we were. But a lot of a lot of institutions, including okay. public schools and stuff like that, are getting rid of merit. Right? There, you know, it's it's a white construct. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's racist. Mm-hmm. It's whatever systemic racism. Or whatever. So we we can't judge people on how well they do. We have to judge them on other superficial character characteristics. So they get rid of merit. But then when it suits them, they claim that merit matters and that having a degree in medicine makes you better than a midwife who has a degree in midwifery. And it doesn't. It, midwives are experts at normal birthing. Yeah. Doctors are experts at high-risk birthing. But 85% of women are probably not high-risk. Therefore, doctors are taking care. 85% of the patients that doctors take care of 
they're not really experts at. Midwives are. Midwives are experts at normal women, and their model allows for them to have better results because they can individualize their care. Nobody goes into midwifery to make a lot of money, and, and you can't do volume in midwifery unless you become a medicalized midwife practice in working for a hospital system. And then that's not what I would call what you and I are talking about when we talk about midwifery model of care. Yeah. Just because a midwife is practicing doesn't mean she's practicing the, mid the midwifery model of care. So what they've done is they've That's taken right. something yeah. that is beautiful and they have vilified it to the point where most of the American population believes that midwives are just not as qualified as OBs. And that's just not simply not true. It's just not true. Midwives, uh, now there are yeah. bad midwives and there are great OBs and there are really bad OBs yeah. and there are really great midwives, right? <laughs> and so there, you can't you can't just take anecdotal stories about this case or that case and make a statement that's broad. That's foolish. Uh, but overall, if you look at the data, and you and I have looked at the data um, very carefully, and I've lived the data for quite some time now, and um, yeah, the outcomes yeah. are so much better in the midwifery model of care. Yeah. Yes, you're going to have some bad outcomes, but as I always, you know, lovingly say. To a client who comes in and asks about, well, what if this happens at home? What if something goes wrong? I say, listen, you know, the newborn intensive care unit is filled with babies that weighed eight pounds, that came inside their mothers to the hospital in perfect condition. And somehow they ended up in the NICU. And nobody says a peep about that. When a midwife has yeah. a baby that ends up in the NICU, everybody's, oh, see what I told you? It's, it's all terrible. This home the midwives don't know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. But they don't, they don't see the normal births. That's the whole thing is that there's no there's no breaking of the silos between the um, the two, which is something you are trying to do, and I know that I'm trying to do. And Augustine Colebrook is one of my my mentors on this idea of you know cl getting collaboration between midwives and doctors and nurses, so they all know each other what they do, and they and because you can't, it's hard for somebody who's never been to a home birth to know what that's like, and it's hard for a midwife who's never watched the hospital yeah. and watched the pressures and the and the uh, demands that are put on a nurse in labor and delivery where they have four to one staffing or some you know crazy thing to see why things are the way they are there. It's a system that's yeah. broken. So anyway, yeah. I forgot where we were because I wanted you to keep track of that. So I hope you wrote it down. Uh, I didn't, but I, I can track back in my head a little bit. So what we were, I, I was really asking about this relationship between the medical industrial complex, which we can say the OBs, that's fine for this purpose. Um, and the midwifery model of care, which I would say is classically is the certified professional midwife or other types of midwives that are working out of the hospital doing births. We also have the certified nurse midwife, which sometimes works in the hospital, sometimes works at home, but oftentimes they're, they kind of drift closer towards the, the OB GYN type of, of birth attendance. Um, so I, yeah, that was where that my original question was. Can you speak to a little bit, a little bit to that from your experience in working in the home environment with so many midwives? And I know almost all of the midwives that you work with, and they're all people I would trust. If we had another baby, they're people I would trust with our own birth. And um, as you know, we had our second baby at home, and our midwife didn't even have to do anything. The baby just came out asleep on my wife's chest. Now, had something gone you know, Harry, we could have gone to the hospital. But the, the point being that most of the time, these things don't need all of the bells and whistles. They don't need the bright lights. They don't need the beeping machines. They don't need a NICU right down the hall. Everything generally goes okay. So why are we, so, so we've developed this, this uh, dogmatic um, sort of doctrine around safety. And in the event that you said 15% of women maybe are in the high risk category. Even if you're in that 85%, you know, low risk group, in the event that something bad happens, don't you want to have all of these great technologies? Don't you want to have an operating room? Don't you want to have Pitocin and all these things available? Well, a lot maybe. of them happen, Nathan, because those things are around, actually. Of, no, of course, of course. I, I'm I'm speaking from the view of the naysayers who are so you know, through cognitive dissonance or whatever else, they're not doing the thing that feels like it's the right thing to do. They're just doing what their employer, the bean counters, the suits and the C-suite expect them to do. 
Um, and they look at us like we're some sort of heretics, which I'll happily wear that, that title, the, a heretic, but, but the, the point being that I don't really see that my skill set is necessarily useful for that many women. I would rather them see a midwife. And there is a deep conditioning now that I think dates way back before the 20th century, way back, whereby midwives, like you said, they're seen as dirty. They've been caricatured um, as dirty, lazy, uneducated, whatever. And that conditioning, I think, runs very, very deep. Oh, it still does. And every day in residency program, um, young, young, enthusiastic, idealistic um, young people are pounded on. To fear this, to fear the process, and to not trust the the midwifery model of care, and so what happens in many communities, Los Angeles, we were lucky. I mean, I'm not there anymore, but Los Angeles, we were fairly lucky because if you needed a consult with an OB, there were a few OBs that you could consult with that wouldn't. First thing they first thing that would happen is they wouldn't look at the patient and say, "What are you out of your mind trying to have a home birth?" or you know that sort of thing. They would be very supportive of the understanding that that. They're a consultant and they're coming in to give an opinion and then they call the midwife back and they t- treat them as a colleague as opposed to, as a, like I said, a lesser subset of their own species and, um, and talk to yeah. them. Yeah. So, but most communities, again, don't have that. I talk to midwives all over the country and in other countries as well, and they're isolated. They can't even get anyone to order an ultrasound for them. Because the ultrasound people won't do an ultrasound without a doctor's order, and no doctor will work with them. So, you know, yeah. where what, what yeah. happened to the Hippocratic Oath? What happened to the idea that we're here to work for the client? Why wouldn't you help? I mean, if you think it's that bad, fine. But it doesn't mean that you can't collaborate with somebody and order an ultrasound for them or sign off on getting some labs for them, but they won't even do that. And part of the reason they won't do that, I think, is. Is their is their indoctrination, but part of it is their fear of liability. They think if their name's on the chart, they're going to get sued. And you know what? There, that's a real mis- unfortunate possibility, right? It's, it's a possibility. It's too bad because yeah. the legal system. That's a whole other talk. We'll talk about that another another day. You know, it's, oh, yeah. it, essentially it's all theater, but yeah, we'll talk another, about it because it, it gets it, it does influence yeah. how a lot of people react. It influences how my midwife colleagues. React. I mean, when we have laws in California that say you can't go past 42 weeks uh, and stay with a midwife, then we have midwives doing things at 41 weeks and four days that they would never be doing otherwise. It's creating harm or, or the potential for harm. Midwives, midwives can do post dates testing. Midwives understand that there are some reasonable things that you can do to reassure everybody that things are okay. And the you know something like 42 weeks is just an arbitrary number. It, it it doesn't really stand for anything. Um, they have they have these artificial numbers that they come up with, that you know that like one size fits all, and medicine and medicine may be algorithmic in teaching, but it's not algorithmic when it comes to the individual human. It should never be. It should be individual yeah. uh, counseling and form consent, and then allowing. The time and respect to let that person make the decision that suits them best. Well, I, I I've probably said this to you before, but I've come to the understanding um, in order to help make me feel a little bit better as to why do I stand out. So why why was medicine ultimately not really the path that I wish I would have taken? You know, I look back and I'm like, gah. I didn't realize I would be in this position now. Like I thought I would be working at some big hospital system. Like back when I started, it was like I was going to wear a white coat and float around and heal people and and just be Mr. Jolly Doctor. And then I realized after all of the years of training and and fellowship and everything that it was like, God, this is just not for me. And and it occurs to me that doctors, especially the doctors that have reached the highest echelons of education, the Harvards, Yale, Hopkins, whatever, they've been incentivized to answer more multiple choice questions correctly over their peers based on the expectations of an examiner. And so your job, if you want to be a doctor, is to guess what is it that this person wants me to say on the exam. 
And if you do that better than other people, you get rewarded with more. And it just keeps ra- ratcheting up until you're at the top of the top, Ivy League, whatever. And you have actually been incentivized not to be a critical thinker, but to be, but to answer the question on every exam based on what somebody else thinks you should say. Think about that for a second. Yeah, I do. And and I think think critically. And I think about you and I think about like my colleague, Victoria Flores, you guys knew, you guys knew in training that this wasn't right. You saw it for what it was then. I have to admit that, you know, I practiced, you know, for 10 years, the, the medical model of obstetrics. If I look back at some of the things I did, I sort of laugh at myself and and forgive myself for some of the things that I did back then about vaginal exams and about um, uh, taking babies over to the warmer immediately after clamping the cord immediately and wondering why, you know, not even thinking twice about why is she flat on her right. back and why am I washing her bottom off with betadine for a vaginal delivery? You know, all these things that that I did, my evolution was much slower. So what is it about, I mean, it's off topic, but you and somebody like Victoria Flores, I mean, you guys got it right away. And so that that's what we need more of to change the mm-hmm. culture. But the culture beats you down. I mean, it's, it is anything. It's like being a, it's like being a Republican on a college campus. I mean, you just, you can't, you can't say anything. You can't do anything. So it's the same sort of thing in residency. It's the person that sticks their head up. That's going to get beaten down on. Uh, so everybody just keeps their head down because residency is a, a rite of passage. It is a tough thing to do. And anybody who gets through it deserves respect. But the problem is they've lost humanity in that process. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It just beats the stewness out of stew, the Nathanness out of Nathan. Like there's nothing left unless you actively, and maybe, you know, Victoria's probably can resonate with this, unless you're actively tuning into what is actually right. And this isn't right. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to fly under the radar, do my thing, earn my credibility, so to speak and still do the thing that I know is right to do thereafter. That takes a, 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 a triumphant amount of courage for anybody in any industry. And I don't think that we're really ever, uh, there's no reward along that entire path in residency for standing up and doing the right thing. It just never happens. So you end up just getting beat down to death nearly. Yeah. You um, asked at the beginning about yeah. obstacles to getting, getting these options, you know, these options more available to, and and again, what you just said was exactly true. But it's also true for the people that are working in the hospital. I mean, I know that there are you, there are rare people who can't take it anymore, like nurses in labor and delivery who quit, and like my friend Lindsay who said uh, these words still reverberate in my head all the time. That every time I went to work, I felt like I was witnessing a crime, um, and she couldn't take Lindsay it. Lindsay Malis, yeah. and um, that I mean that comment still sticks in my head and I, and I reiterate, I mean, I repeat it when I'm teaching because you are stuck between, you know, you have a, you have loans to pay, you have rent to pay, you have children, you have a, you know, you have a marriage, you have things that you have bills you have to pay. If you say something in that system, you're very likely to be fired. And, and that, that goes for the patients too. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I've seen some tyranny from pediatric offices that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. If you're not vaccinated for COVID, don't come to our office. If you are baby is sick, take your baby to the um, urgent care. Don't bring your sick baby to our office. It's like you're a pediatrician's office. What are you there yeah, for? You're a doctor. Yeah. You're, you're yeah, doctor what, for, what you, you're you doctor for kids. Doctor? The kid's sick. Don't bring him here. That sort of thing. So, and if you have, and the latest one was from Texas, where there was a group of pediatricians who said, if you have a home birth, you can't, your, your kids can't come here. Now, for me, that's a blessing that they're warning you that you don't want, if you have a home birth, you don't even want to go there. But the idea that right. they think that somebody having a home birth doesn't deserve their pediatric care is bizarre to me. The vaccine thing is really interesting too, because they, you know, they might say, because our, our second, had no vaccines. Our first had a couple and then we put the kibosh on that. Our second didn't even have a birth certificate until recently. But she, um, if she were to go to the pediatrician's office, I would be, I would be a little concerned that they're going to be 
kind of butthurt that me as their dad, another physician, didn't get the vaccines. And they might say, you could have done this to prevent all of this. Shame on you. We don't want to take care of you because you didn't do the easily preventable things. Fine, whatever. But if we were to look at that in any other area of medicine, like let's say um, uh, uh, an endocrinologist, a person with severe type 2 diabetes, oh, if you hadn't eaten poorly and not slept, you know, slept better, exercise more, whatever, you wouldn't be here. Sorry, we're not, I'm not going to take care of you. The preventative things that, that, that you were told to do and you didn't do them, we're not going to take care of you. That sounds completely absurd. But of course, we're seeing this type of bizarro behavior all over a medicine, especially in maternity care. Agreed. Agreed. I think people listening are going to understand that you and I are like two peas from the same pod. How old are you, Stu? I'm 66. Okay. Had I been born 30 years before, a little under 30 years before, um, over 30 years before, I would have been Stu. You may, maybe, um, maybe, not. Maybe, not. maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I would have had a total awareness, aware, Look at, I wasn't me when I was me, <laughs> if, that, if that makes any sense. Um, well, I may not have actually been as... Uh, I may have not found the uh, the courage, perhaps is the word, to do what I do now had I not met you halfway through residency. And you and I, I'm going to go into the breach conversation now because this is a big thing that you do that very very few people do. You had come to a um, a lunchtime chat with uh, Elliot Berlin was there, Emilio Chavira was there, and he was no longer at Kaiser, but he had come in for this talk, and then you were presenting. And it was all about breach. And most of our faculty, including the program director, were not super thrilled with <laughs> no, the they weren't. teaching breach. But to their credit, they brought you guys in and you gave a, fen- a phenomenal uh, presentation. I started hanging out with you and hanging out with Milo more like outside of work and just kind of learning from you guys. Had I not met you, I'm not so sure I would have either A, finished residency because I would have just been so like defeated by it. Um or B, I don't know if I would have had the courage to say, oh, I actually have the skills and the 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 foresight to maybe develop something of my own that does serve me and my my patients. So so having said that and tooted your horn sufficiently, your head's getting so big, it's I can't even keep it on the camera anymore. I <laughs> I um want to talk a little bit about breach. Before you go, before you go on breach, I just have one comment on that. Um listen, I I appreciate I appreciate when you say that because to know that I had influence over you is my greatest accomplishment. When I, when I get an email from a, a midwife who says, Stu, I had a surprise breach yesterday and I had taken your course last August and I knew exactly what to do and everything was beautiful. There's nothing better than I, when I get a letter like that. You know, I get very yeah. emotional and stuff like that. And the other thing too is that had you been a resident in 1982 when I started, you can't say what would have happened because you, this is a very piece of broad wisdom here, but you should only judge people by the in the time in which they lived, and in 1982, I mean, the, some hospital things have never ch- have not changed, as you know. But there was a it was a whole different world yeah. back then. We didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that stuff. So life was completely different, and you can't yeah. even imagine what it might have been like to be a, a resident. And then we didn't. You didn't have the residency protections that you guys had. I I mean I'm I'm not tooting my own horn here, but when I was at County Hospital rotating for four months as part of my Cedars residency, we, we were on every... I, I, oh, it's, yeah, oh we you went to USC. USC. It was the busiest hospital in the country at the time. They were doing about 22,000 yeah. births a year, which is about 65 babies a day, if you break that down. And, oh, my God. And we would work 24-hour shift. We'd take a few hours to sign out and do all that other stuff and catch up on your paperwork. You'd go home, you'd crash, you'd come back and work another 24 hours. So there, there were times where we were working like 30-hour days. And now apparently that's there's rules against that. So it was an entirely different world. But we also got away with things that you could never get away with now in training. And that's why I'm good at a lot of the things that I'm good at is because it was a different era. What I, How I train can't be done anymore because you can't just do things to people yeah. because you wanted to try them. And, 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 and the county was, county yeah, was a, yeah. you know, was a great laboratory for teaching, but it was a zoo. It was a laboratory. And, um, uh, those things don't exist anymore. There's too many rules and too many, 
you know, top heavy administrators. My mother, this is an anecdote. My mother was a teacher in the, in, in the Hopkins uh, Golden Valley School District. And when she started, she, there was one principal in her school district. By the time she finished, there was no music teacher, no gym teacher, and there was one principal and six assistant principals. All right, for for a declining wow. enrollment. So again, everything becomes top heavy. Administrators don't really do a whole lot of the work, but they tell people doing the work how to do the work, and then they hire more of themselves. When there's when they need to lay off people, they never lay themselves off. There was a there was a Harvard Business Review article recently. It was like maybe in the past couple of years. I just it stands out to me because of what you're saying, and it was like. There's this crisis. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors, whatever. They're all overworked. They're all burned out. They're committing suicide and this and that. And then this, what this article looked at was, well, who are we hiring in healthcare? And it was like something like 65% of hires in the past, you know, whatever time they were yeah, looking at were all right. administrative staff. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I, it may have been more than that. It may have been 80%, but I, I can't remember. Regardless, it was, it was way more than you would expect. So you and I met at this breach educational talk, uh, educational talk about breach. Um, it was not something I'd ever seen in residency, um, really had never seen it up until that point. I still had never seen a baby come out feet or butt first. And so what I learned, what I gleaned from that talk was, okay, maybe this isn't going to be a standard part of my practice, maybe because I was still young. But what happens if I'm a self-sufficient OBGYN at a hospital system somewhere and a, a woman comes in, she's contracting painfully, and I, I, I do a vaginal exam, a consensual vaginal exam, and I feel a butt, or I see a butt, a rump coming out of the vagina instead of a head. So I saw what you were presenting as, oh, this is really good information for me to have because this is still in my wheelhouse. What am I going to do? Just say, I've never seen this and try to call somebody else? So despite no, you're gonna, put, that, you're gonna push you're gonna push the rump back up inside and do a C section. <laughs> which sounds like the silliest fucking thing in the world. But it is. Here we are. So uh St Stu, why don't you tell us about what happened to Breach? You're wearing your shirt right now, reteach Breach. Um, through birthing instincts, you guys teach people this similar to what Rixa and David do and Christine through uh, Breach Without Borders. Um, you use a simulator. Why I've already kind of given you the answer, but tell me a little bit about breach. Why did why was this an area that you felt compelled to start re-educating people on? Um, that's a, that's a, a multi-level question. I'm going to just start back at the beginning. When I was training, I um, was very lucky because I trained. In, we talked about earlier. I trained in an era where breach was considered just a variation of normal and it was taught in my residency program. And when I was at County, we saw at least, you know, on average two to three breaches a day uh, because of the volume of clients we were doing. So for me, it was just a normal thing. In the eighties, in the late seventies and eighties and nineties, there were papers that were coming out that supported vaginal breach delivery. And there were papers that coming out that were saying we need to section all breaches. And so there was this, dichotomy going on and depending on which program you were you were following certain guidelines and then in 2000 as people anybody who knows breach knows there's a paper that came out called the term breach trial which definitively showed at that time that that c-section was better for outcomes for breaches now i have to digress here for a second and say that when you look at papers, you can't just read the abstract and the, and the um, conclusions. You right. have to read the material and methods section. And what no one did, even the peer reviewers of this paper, was they did not look at it critically because it met the model by which they wanted to practice. Right. And when they use words like riskier or safer or more dangerous, that doesn't mean anything unless they give you the numbers behind it. And in a lot of these papers, they don't. They use relative risk. They don't use actual risk because they have a point they're trying to make. So the term breach trial was actually a very badly controlled trial, and yet it passed all the muster and immediately was adopted worldwide. And training programs began to stop doing breach deliveries and hospitals that had been doing breach deliveries, even hospitals that had been participating in the term breach trial doing breach deliveries, suddenly stopped doing breach deliveries and the breach training had disappeared. Right. Well, that's, and the only that's people critical. that were that's critical is the fact that we stopped training people, residents like me, in the United States on the basic maneuvers that would help facilitate a 
breech birth that is perhaps hung up with a nuchal arm, hyperextended neck, etc. Yeah. I mean, think about it, Nathan. I mean, they, they never think about these things in this way. But breaches, say it's 4%, 3 to 4%. That means one out of every 25 women who come to your office are going to be breached at term. And you're supposed to be an obstetrical expert, and you're not expert in something that happens one out of every 25 times. I mean, a cardiac expert may rarely, rarely see abnormal cardiac vessels in somebody, but they know what to do with it. Um, you know, a, a dermatologist may see pemphigus three times in his career, but he'll know what to do with it. But here right. we have something that's one in every 25 births, and we didn't know what to do with it, and we got rid of it. And so the only people that were still continuing to do it were midwives, and they are still the torchbearers of this, of this skill. And so what happened was it disappeared from training, and it became um, taboo. And then, of course, once it was taboo, it was taught to be taboo. And so every resident was taught that breach was dangerous and all breaches should be sectioned without ever asking why. And of course, the people like you or Victoria who would ask why would probably get beat up in the system um, figuratively, not literally, but um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so yeah. nobody asks why, because because uh, ultimately expediency wise, it's just easier to schedule a C-section for a breech baby at 39 weeks than to have to be waiting for them to go into labor and then be nervous about it the whole time. That's right. Yeah. So it just sort of disappeared. That's that's essentially what happened. But the data doesn't support that. And data has come out in droves since that time. Rickson has a really good presentation with some really good slides about the comparing it to some bunch of other studies. And the only study where there was this big difference between vaginal and cesarean breach was a term breach trial. And every other study, some of which are 10 times larger than the term breach trial, and right. controlled for all the problems of the term breach trial, found almost no difference. And certainly if right. there's almost no right. difference, or even if there's a greater difference, ultimately the decision doesn't belong to the institution to ban breach or to OB to tell a woman she can't have a breach. The ultimate decision belongs to the informed women. And it's a shame that women who do have breaches, and I, Stu, I'm getting maybe one request per week of somebody with a breech baby who can't either find a provider. Um, some women aren't even able to find somebody willing to do an external cephalic version, nope. which to me is like at Kaiser, I did 10 of those per week. Most of them were successful. Um, we would rather, instead of doing that, and they want you to get an epidural, they want you to do all those things. And if we do turn the baby, you're going to automatically be you know, coerced into induction. I mean, it's just not a very pleasant place out there for, um, for women who are, who have a breech baby at 36 weeks plus. So, and none of it, ev none, none of it, Nathan is supported by the evidence. I don't like to use the term evidence-based information because that implies that the evidence you're using to base your decision on is actually good evidence. Right. <laughs> and a lot of times it's not. So, um, but it's not scientifically supported by, by the data. It's one option. And women should be informed that they have an option for a cesarean section, but they should be told why that that option is something that it's being suggested. In other words, that there's a diminished risk of this and this and this and this, but how big a diminishment is it? They're never told that. And they're right. never, they never asked that question that I talked about earlier. They're never asked, especially if it's their first baby, do you want a second child? Because if you do right. want a second child, then all you've done is you've taken the risk that you may be eliminated from this child and pass it on to every other child that woman will ever have. Right. Which which ties in nicely to the VBAC conversation we just had earlier in the in this recording. The the risk of C section after C section. Well, one of the primary uh, uh, causes, or whatever you want to say, or the primary reasons for which we're doing C sections, and I would argue probably unnecessarily for many women is breech baby. Now you've bought yourself your first C-section. Now you have to find a provider that's okay with VBAC. And if you don't, then you're set up with another C-section, another after that. What if that baby could have either been turned or you just had a breech birth? Um, but providers in the United States, midwives and OBGYNs, new midwives that is, are not being taught a lot of the maneuvers to help facilitate a smooth breech birth. Birth. You know, so, and they're, all, they're also not taught, Nathan, that if you meet certain criteria at term, 
and this is your first baby, that in my experience, which is extensive, you have about an 80% chance of delivering vaginally. Now, when you take you when you take the the heads up documentary that you and I have both seen a, a lot of times, um, yeah. one of the women says in there when she's talking about Dr. Wu, she says, you know, he has a 90% success rate overall, which is amazing when you think about the average woman walking into the hospital has about a three in ten chance of having a C section anyway. So right. you know, right. having a breach term delivery with somebody who knows what they're doing at with your first baby. You, you may have a 20% chance of a C-section, whereas when you come into a hospital with a head down baby, you've got a higher risk of C-section. And what's really troubling for me is when I hear about a woman who's had, say, two, three vaginal deliveries and her fourth baby is breech. And as you said, they're not offered an uh, external cephalic version and they're told they should have a C-section. My success rate with multiparous women, which means women that have had at least one vaginal delivery with a breech baby that meets the criteria that I use is 100%. Now, it won't always be 100%, but to say, wow. even say if it was 95% or 98%, and you're telling all those women that a C-section is safer for them, you're either, you're either being obtuse or you're absolutely outright lying. There's no other alternative there. There's no alternative that says that you're giving them honest and good advice. You may be giving them the advice that you that's all you know, but that, that, isn't, that isn't honest. And here's a right. real, and here, and this could even tie into the twin topic, is that when a when a breach when a woman finds out she's breached, she's already 36, 37, 38, 39 weeks, and so a doctor that doesn't know how to do breach is sort of limited in in the options that they can offer that woman, because they don't do breach delivery. But when you find out at ten weeks that you're having twins, and your doctor isn't an expert in breach delivery. And about half of all twins at term, at least one of the babies will be breech. Yeah. That doctor should tell you, you know what? You've got twins. I'm not an expert in twins because I don't do breech delivery and half of all twins are going to have a breech baby. You should go see somebody else. But that's not what they do. They lie. They just say, oh, mm. twins are going to be, we're going to probably induce you or schedule your C-section at 37 weeks. They don't tell them why. They they throw out the risks of stillbirth, the dead baby thing that you've talked about. And the, these things are not honest. They're just not honest. People want honest information. It's, it's very hard to find. So there's two issues here. One, there's a de-skilling of birth attendants, specifically OBGYNs. And two, there's co a complete perversion of informed consent. Yeah, that's actually that actually summarizes my last 10 minutes in, in a nutshell. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I'll just be your mouthpiece, Stu. <laughs> yeah. In summary, there's a decrease, there's a decrease, there's a de-skilling and, and a skewing of informed consent. That's correct. Yeah. That's it. Because it was a skill that was basically a normal skill until the late eighties and early nineties. And by 2000, um, breach delivery was actually kind of fun. And for those of us that do breaches, you know, there's, any birth, there's always a little anxiety in the in the caregiver, whether they admit it or not. It's always in, not in your stomach because you, but you're prepared for that. That's why you trained. If all babies just fell out, why would anyone go through the eight years of like crazy torture that that a lot of doctors do to become an OBGYN? But you don't yeah. need that skill all the time, yeah. and having that apprehension be the thing that drives you and that rules you means that maybe you should be finding something else to do. And I would say to many of my OB colleagues who are, who are bathed in fear because that's how they were trained, what a life are you, what life, what kind of life are you living? Yeah. Why do you want to live like that? Why do you want to go to work every day in, with anxiety? So, so I've got this, uh, I've got a friend in Louisville who builds houses. He flips houses and then yeah. he makes them beautiful and rents them out. He does everything from the plumbing to the electrical. He does it all. He is an expert in building houses. And OBGYN claims to be an expert in attending birth. The problem is that you are deficient in a variety of other skills that would actually make you an expert in attending birth. But just like my friend Brad, he can't say he's an expert in building houses if he doesn't have all of the skills to build a house. He can be a project manager and hire all the different people to do the job. But he is a expert in building houses. Likewise, with an OBGYN, I don't think we can call ourselves experts in birth. I think we're experts in intervening in birth. And I think we're experts in C-section. I think we're really, really good at those two things. 
And, so, and oftentimes it still leads to okay outcomes. Now, granted, most of our, our composite outcomes aren't really necessarily uh, uh, sort of illustrated in the literature, you know, like things like maternal neonatal bonding, breastfeeding, the, the postpartum recovery, et cetera. Like a C-section is a big surgery. So we don't usually incorporate a lot of these sort of immeasurable aspects of, of the transition into parenting from the standpoint of C-section. All that we're concerned about is blood loss, infection, is mom and baby alive? Yeah. And that's good enough for us. So if those are our only metrics, then doing a C-section, hey, why not? You and your baby are going to be alive afterwards. Isn't that good enough? And it's not good enough. It's not good enough because you're not actually a true expert in your field. I'm trying to become a true expert in my field. I believe that you are a true expert in the field, one of the few. And I think that that's a dying breed. You know, I don't think that there are too many obstetricians that are fully capable of everything that could come their way. And that's a problem. It's a really, really big problem. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, I, I'm not, a, you know, confident people are not afraid to say they don't know something. And it's insecure people that are have a harder time saying that. Like, I'm really not an expert in OBGYN anymore. Because I haven't done gyneco I haven't done gynecologic right, surgery right, in twelve years, right? So I would never pretend to take on somebody who needed a hysterectomy. And even if I ever got hospital privileges back, which they probably won't let me, and I probably would never want to go back there, um, I couldn't. I couldn't cover. Uh, I couldn't do a laborious shift if I had to cover the GYN ER, right? And take somebody. You know, I'd have to. I'd have to do a refresh. I mean, it would come back to me. But I would be freely admit that I I'm not the person to do your ectopic laparoscopic uh, myomectomy. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm not going to be doing that. Right, right, because I I haven't done that. But I am an expert in obstetrics, and if I had to do a C-section again, could I do one? Yeah, that's sort of become that that's like riding a bicycle. I think, um, you know, once you've done hundreds of C-sections, even if you haven't done one for a decade, you you could. You it's not something right. you can remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you're right. I mean, I, I think most of our colleagues think they're OBGYNs, but if you don't know something, that if you if you add up breaches and twins, you're talking about seven percent of pregnancies. That's one out of what fourteen. What one out of every fourteen women that walks into your office, you're not an expert at, and you're claiming to be an expert. Mm. It's yeah. It, it should be a wake up call. And you know, I feel bad for the young physicians who are coming out or or, or going into training, being trained by these you know, these old curmudgeons, whether they be male or female curmudgeons, because curmudgeon can be a female as well. <laughs> um, but they're, they're training them to fear birth and to, to, to not be an expert in their field when they come out. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's bizarre. I mean, somebody could come out of the best residency program in the country. I don't know, Johns Hopkins or Harvard. And then they, they want to get a job, say, in a field hospital in Alaska, and they're going to say, well, do you know how to do a breech delivery? And they're going to say no, and they're not going to, you know, they, they're not an obstetrician because they can't do, they can't put forceps on. Right. But we don't have an operating room here in Alaska that's available. You have to be able to do these things. Oh, we can't do those things. Yeah. Training programs should train you. Yeah. I mean, especially when you invest so much, so much of your life to a, to a, to a skill, to an art. Um, it's become so protocolized and you're right. It's, it's largely based in fear. I, I think a lot about people like Christine Laria, who does work with MSF now, Doctors Without Borders. And she yeah. said, you know, we have to call a general surgeon if we need a C-section. My C-section rate's less than 5% because I literally don't have any option, but to get this baby out vaginally. And she does. Um, and we're talking like South, like, like South Sudan. I mean, like refugee camps and whatnot. Um, that is a skilled obstetrician. That's a, I mean, she's a midwife, but even obstetrics was kind of co-opted by the medical industrial complex because obstetrics means standing opposite of, which really, I think, uh, I think reflects more the midwifery care model as opposed to I'm the captain of the ship and here's how things are going to go because I don't have the skills to do the other well, thing. Here's a perfect example. Of, you may have heard this before, but I think your listeners may not have. Um, you know, the World Health Organization, which gets mixed reviews, obviously, um, for many things. But they think that the C-section rate in Western countries should be 10 to 15%. Right. All right. Well, just say in the United States, it's 30%. And if you take the 15% recommendation, that means that half of all the C-sections being done 
in the United States, according to the World Health Organization, are, are not necessary. We don't have to get into the politics of the World Health Organization, but we can say that countries all over the world are following what they're saying. They take what they say regarding certain uh, viruses as, as, as God. So that's what they're saying. So half of all C-sections being done are unnecessary. In the United States, there's about 4 million babies bearing every year. If you have a 30% C-section rate, that's about 1.2 million cesareans, maybe a little higher. But we'll just say 1.2. That means that there's 600,000 unnecessary surgeries being done every year on pregnant women. If there were 600,000 unnecessary knee surgeries or mastectomies or anything else, then not only would people be outraged, but insurance companies would be outraged because they're paying for all these unnecessary surgeries and they wouldn't want to do that. But nobody says a peep about this, Nathan. And yet half of all the women getting a C-section are probably getting it unnecessarily. But here's where the, here's where the whole kicker cognitive dissonance thing rolls in, because if you ask yourself, who's doing the unnecessary C-sections? Because no doctor goes home at night and says to their spouse, hey, honey, guess what? I did two unnecessary C-sections. <laughs> Every C-section I do is necessary, yet half of all C-sections are unnecessary. So that means somebody has to be doing the unnecessary C-sections, but it's always the other guy. Yeah. But the other guy is saying it's you. Mm. And yet half of all C-sections, this is the classic example of cognitive dissonance, the classic example of what's being taught in our residency programs, um, or not being taught, how to think critically how to look at this stuff and say, well, is the World Health Organization wrong? Should the C-section rate be 30%? Well, then why don't we yell at countries like Brazil or Armenia or South Africa who have 70, 80% C-section rates? It can't possibly be that that's, they're all indicated. And as right. you said earlier, it's a major operation with major recovery, major long-term consequences, major consequences for the mother and potentially for that baby born by cesarean section. Yeah. You know, small risks but risks nonetheless that should be given to a woman of things like autoimmune disorders and childhood asthma and adult onset diabetes and all that for babies born by electively scheduled C-sections as our, as our, both our mentors, Michelle O'Dont would like to say, it's those, it's those pre-labor cesareans that are the real problem. All right. So, yeah, so we've touched VBAC, we've touched breach, we've sort of touched twins. Uh, what else would you want to elaborate on? Why don't we just very briefly um, let's talk just a little bit about twins. How do you, how do you counsel a person who is hoping to have a, a home birth? They've been diagnosed with twins diagnosed. I don't even really think that's an appropriate word. They have oh, this yeah, condition of twins and, um, and they want to have a home birth. Are there certain types of twins that you're okay with versus not okay with as an attendant, because you think that the risk benefit ratio um, seems to fall out of favor? Not just by title alone, but let's talk a little bit about chorionicity real quickly. Um, fraternal twins or non-identical twins are called diamniotic, dichorionic twins. They each have their own amnion, they each have their own chorion. These are the two layers of cells that surround a singleton fetus. Those, those babies are, the biggest risk they face generally is preterm labor. Um, if, if babies in my practice make it to term, which I would consider for twins to be about 35 weeks or more. And um, then there's no, then I don't have any problem with die, die twins or fraternal twins. With identical twins, they can either be monoamniotic, monochorionic, where they're in the same sac, which is a high mortality rate, very high risk of something called twin twin transfusion syndrome or one of the other uh, uh, placental anomalies syndromes. And those babies are almost all delivered by cesarean section because they can get tangled up in cords and they can have problems and there's high risk for those. So those are not something that I would be uh, worry, uh, even considering in a home birth setting. As far as the monochorionic diamniotic twins, which are what are called identical twins, um, but they have separate sacs, the separate amnions and same chorion, they have about a 15 to 17 percent risk of something called TTTS. And if that develops, that's generally a problem. They're not going to make it to term. There are, you know, sometimes we badmouth interventions in medicine. One of the beautiful things that I've that's happened in my lifetime is the ability to treat this with laser surgery. And they're coming up with possibly even non-invasive type laser surgery or ultrasound uh, working to, to, to uh, ligate the vessels that communicate between these two twins. 
But that's something that they're not going to probably make it to term. They're almost always going to go preterm and they're not going to make it term. But if monochorionic diamniotic twins make it to 30, 30 weeks, 32 weeks, 33 weeks, and have no signs of this intrauterine transfusion thing going on, then there really are no different, statistically speaking, in my, in my data. And Rick and I are coming out with a paper, hopefully this spring, on, on my twin experience. Um, she'll pre- pretty soon she'll have twins without borders, too, I think. <laughs> Rick will do that. Um, but uh, then, then monochorionic diamniotic twins are not something that I would treat any differently if they got to labor. And my success rate is very high. Again, with multiparous twins who make it to term, who meet the criteria that we use in our, in our birthing instincts model, the, the success rate with multips is about 98%. We had 47 out of 48 that delivered vaginally at home, which is pretty darn good. Pretty great. And they were with all die die. Is that right? All die die? No, 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 no. No, it's all kind die or mono die. Okay. If they make it to term. And of the primep twins, we, we had a 67% success rate. So 33% of the win, women that went into labor ended up having to go to the hospital. Again, our numbers are small. They don't meet uh, statistical significance. So they're sort of case reports and anecdotal things and in, in, in a clinical series. They're not something that you can lay your hat on with what we call level A evidence. But certainly people who say that having twins at home is dangerous don't have any evidence to support that on either because there is no data right. in the world that's of any quality that's based on home birthing of twins. This will be the first paper that comes out that's ever been with a single practitioner using certain criteria and shows a 98% success rate with multips and a 67% wow. success rate with primips, which is still two out of three. Now, almost all twins in the medical model Will either be induced at 37 weeks or they'll be sectioned. Right. That gets back to the World Health Organization's point about unnecessary C-section. What is what's unnecessary is often not thought of as unnecessary by our colleagues who are medically trained. Yeah. When I um when I was still in Encinitas, this is while I was still in fellowship, I called you about a twins, uh, a twins birth that I was attending to. It was in the hospital setting. But she went to 40 weeks, 40, almost 41 weeks before she started mm-hmm. drinking red raspberry leaf tea and getting that going. And um, both babies were head down. It was die-die twins, meaning both, you know, you already described this, but separate sacs, separate placenta. It's basically two completely separate pregnancies just developing inside the same uterus. Um, the, they were both head down, which is a, a part of the conversation in the hospital system. Um, but that first baby came out and the second baby was just hanging, came down slowly, was head down. Everything sounded fine. So we wheeled her back to the labor and delivery suite and we chilled out. I went back home (laughs) just up the street and I got a call from the nurses. Oh, it's, it seems like that baby's coming now. This was like 12 hours later. I rode back by the time I got into the door, the nurse had already caught the baby. And uh, the reason I'm telling the story is that when I signed this out to the oncoming laborist, I th- I her jaw hit the ground um, in disbelief that I would have allowed 12 hours to pass between these two babies um, being born. And the reason I I think that the, that these types of stories are are um, essential for our narrative is that had I just panicked and f- and tried to force that baby out, we could have ended up in greater distress. We could have ended up with a C-section, meaning she's going to recover from a vaginal birth and a C-section while nursing two brand new babies. Like It's just an impossibility. So this story is not meant to toot my own horn, but unless every single thing goes perfectly as a- anticipated, most people who work within the medical system are going to jump right to C-section or some other potentially harmful intervention. And I have contributed on the good side of lowering our C-section rate by just being patient, being thoughtful, and allowing things to unfold the way that they will. There was no reason for us to be worried that second baby's just taking their time. They're, they're going to come through eventually, and sure enough, they did. 
But I don't think uh, I'd ever seen a vaginal birth of twins whereby the second twin wasn't removed through uh, an extraction when I was in residency. And even so, that was pretty rare. So I described sort of the ideal scenario in the uh, circumstance that a baby, the second baby, turns breech or even uh, uh, transverse instead of coming down he head first. There is a procedure whereby you can go and reach up and and do an extraction. That was the only other way I had seen twins come if they were going to come vaginally when I was in residency. Can you describe that a little bit for people, uh, how you attend to that second baby and what the options might be? Yeah. Before I do that, I want to just comment on the 12-hour in intermittent. You know, It was very reasonable for you to do that in that situation because she was being monitored. She was being observed. Um, I have reviewed the literature on, on what's called twin-to-twin -twin interval. And there is data that supports that the, the longer the twin to twin interval goes, the more likely you are to end up with an acidotic or a slightly depressed baby B. So I just want people to know that. And my own anecdotal observation is that the longer you go with a twin to twin interval, the more likely you are to end up with a postpartum hemorrhage as well. I don't know. I don't think your lady hemorrhage, yeah, but I that. think that it's just more common. So we're not, I, I just want to make sure that people who are listening to the podcast, we're not advocating that. You should always wait, you know, wait 12 hours between twins. There is a reason sometimes to go up and break the bag of waters and, and, and intervene. As to your question, um, breach extraction, yeah, it's a it's another skill that we teach in our reteach breach seminars and that Rick said David, I, I think they teach it in their in their breach without borders. Maybe they don't. Because I do twin, I talk about I do a twin day too, and I and I have an upright trainer and a lithotomy trainer. I have two trainers, and so we're working on doing it in both positions. But it, it's a skill that's very necessary. And even if you have a singleton breach that's, say, frank or complete breach, there are maneuvers you can do if the baby suddenly takes a dive and you need to get that baby out quickly. If you know what you're doing, it's actually not hard to do. It's uncomfortable for the mother, especially in a situation where you know, they're not anesthetized. But I also believe that not having an epidural is a, a better chance for success in all of your labors anyway. I think epidurals meddle with the whole process yeah. and, and, and interfere with the baby's uh, in, uh, communication with its mother. But that's another, again, another talk for another day. Uh, but being able to reach up inside, you, you find the feet, all right? And you find the feet and then you um, uh, grab the feet. Or if you can only get one foot, you grab one foot, you pull that one foot down and out, you hold on to it with the other hand. The other hand, go back up, find the other foot. And once you get the two feet, then you just bring the baby down as far down as you can get it. And then you do your maneuvers that we teach that every obstetrician should know how to do. Because sometimes you even have to do these maneuvers at cesarean section. When you do a cesarean section for breach, you're still delivering the baby breach. And if you don't know the maneuvers, you can easily injure the baby. Um, shoulders, neck, clavicles, humerus, um, because you don't know the cardinal movements of a breech birth. And then you do your maneuvers and you get the baby out. And I've done that many times. And uh, I'm grateful for that skill. I'm grateful for the chance that I had the opportunity in my residency program to learn that skill because yeah. I think it's not only saved a lot of C-sections, but it's probably saved some lives yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it, sort of in summary of all of these really important topics, and I appreciate your patience today with uh, such a <laughs> with a tech, tech with a tech. tech issue, but also with the sort of flowing nature. I mean, you and I can just riff for hours, so I appreciate your patience. And uh, but I think what was most important for me was for people to understand a little bit about what truly informed consent might look like from the standpoint of the history of C-section breach twins. I think there's a lot of information being left out. There aren't true options being given. And as soon as somebody hears, this is the only way that it has, that, that it can be done. You're, you're probably not being provided with all of the information or the physician or midwife is not being completely forthright about their skills. And they're telling you, this is the only way to do it either based on their hospital policy or based on their, their poor education, unfortunately. Um, I won't say that I had the best education, but I've had to go out and look for mentors and look for programs where I can fine tune all of the things that that you know I have gotten to be good at. You know, and it, had I not taken several workshops on breach and 
um, gone to a, at least one home birth with you. I can't remember if we had done more than one, but um, had I not pursued that for myself, I don't think I would be a well-rounded birth attendant. I just don't think that that would have been possible based on the way that residency training through the lens of the medical industrial complex is provided in our country. And I'll add to that about the breach. You know, we we could have gone a little, a lot deeper on the breach conversation, but when you look at countries where they're still teaching the breach breach maneuvers, there's absolutely a wash. There's there's no difference between out, in, in outcomes. If there is, it's very that's different. right. So right. so what so in the United States, and that's only and that's only looking at that initial outcome. It's not looking downstream right. at what all exactly. the other outcomes are subsequent to that birth. Right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you when you have a composite of all of the long and short term outcomes. We really need to be reteaching breach. Um, you offer plenty of workshops yourself. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how people can find you, Stu? Yeah. Can I can I just comment on what you said first? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because Nathan, you have a really good way of talking, and 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 you have a humbleness and an and with your expertise. And we did a podcast with the Down to Birth uh, group, and they it was called. Uh, we talked about red flags. And you talked about when, when doctors tell you that it has to be this way or there's only one way to do it or that's dangerous or the pull, they pull out the coercion cards that we talked about. And one of the things that stuck with me from that podcast, well, more than one, but this one stuck with me, is when a woman goes to her prenatal visit, they're usually a little apprehensive. They're excited, but they're apprehensive. So the question you, uh, that you decide if this is a good practitioner for you is how do you feel when you leave the office? Do you feel better or do you feel worse? Mm. Did you feel like you were talked down to or you were talked to? These sorts of things that, that really matter. And if you leave your doctor's office feeling like your questions weren't answered or that they didn't seem to matter or that you actually are more anxious now that, than when you walked in, you don't have to settle for that. Right. You need to find somebody who, who speaks like Nathan does. Yeah. You need to find somebody who's humble like Nathan who would, who's able to admit – that they don't know anything, but also talks and asks questions like, how do you feel about that? Yeah. What do you think you're, what, what would you like to see happen? As opposed to, and, you, and by the way, we have the luxury of asking questions like that because we have the time to do it. Yeah. Because our model doesn't have this assembly line version of prenatal care or, or doctor's office visits. When you worked for Kaiser, if you would have gotten a job for Kaiser, You'd have no say about your right, schedule. Right, right. It would be booked for you, and you'd expect you're expected to do things in six minutes or eight minutes or twelve minutes, depending on what it is. Your annual gynecologic exam, you get twelve minutes or, or fourteen minutes for that. That's right. So if a woman comes in with a, any problem, you don't have time to talk about it. Yeah, that sort of thing. So, how to reach me? Um, best place is to go to my website at birthinginstincts.com, and everything's there. All the links to every all my anything social. I found out today I was meeting with my uh, assistant Emily, and I found out today I do have a Twitter account. <laughs> and I actually had there's some posts on Twitter from like two years ago. I never knew that I even had a Twitter account, so I don't think I'm going to start tweeting. But but I do have an Instagram account, and that's at Birthing Instincts. And then of course, Bliss and I uh, every Wednesday release our podcast, which is the Birthing Instincts podcast, where we have our own little style of laughing and crying with each other. And we've been together for a really long time now. And it's sort of a, a, a fun listen if people want to get something about birth, but also be entertained a little bit. It's one of the only podcasts I listen to routinely. Like I subscribe to it. So it just downloads to my phone. It's a, you guys have a great, a great thing going, you and Bliss. So um, I hope everybody you, can Nathan. check it out. And um, if you guys want to learn from Stu, breach maneuvers and everything in between. Um, I do highly recommend you find one of his workshops. And of course, you can learn from all of these people that we've been talking about all in one place in August, um, August 10th through the 13th. Make sure you just clear your call schedule, make it make it happen. This is a very, very unique opportunity in Louisville. Um, and I'm so gla- so grateful that you're going to be there, Stu. And if you come, if you come to my website, on you can go to the events page and you can uh, see what's co- cooking, and then you can sign up through that page. And also, you know, I, I know that I live in a small rural part of Utah now, so I, I've been emphasizing my um, like you do too. I have a virtual consultation question service that people can go to, so that they can they, and I can give them an hour of my time on on Zoom. Um, 
and, and answer questions, whether you live in Buffalo, New York, or, uh, you know, uh, Seattle, Washington, wherever you want, and anywhere in between, you, you can reach out and find me. And Nathan, I think you have one too at your uh, website as well. Yeah, I call it my collaborator program. It's it's a little bit more involved than yours, but I love that you have that available because I I can't even keep up with the demand. I mean, our midwife colleagues are really struggling in many states, not being able to find any collaboration with any doctors. And as you know, license restrictions oftentimes require that they consult for everything under the sun, like a infected pimple. I mean, like they... They're just their their hands are cuffed unless they get a doctor to sign off on something. It's just completely ridiculous. Yeah, it so, takes us it takes us full circle to the beginning of our conversation when we talked about right. how how midwives are, are are professionals and they're excellent in what they do, uh, and the medical model just can't really handle the fact that yeah. they've got competition from outside. Look, at, they're going to come after naturopaths. They're going to come after you know Chinese medicine. They're going to come after Ayurvedic pract- practitioners. The, you know, we have to hold our ground because yeah. when when a system is dying, it doesn't just die; it fights really hard for a Tooth system that isn't working to keep it to keep hold of their power. Well, I did an episode on my podcast. It was like a two hour long solo cast episode seventy two, Stu, that you'd probably love on one of your next walks. It's it's a brief ish history of Western medicine, witches, and women healers. It gets into over the past several hundred years, it really goes all the way back to ancient Sumer, but especially over the past several hundred years, the Flexner Report came out and it was basically, uh, I, I'd mentioned that before, but basically the Carnegie's and Rockefeller's had a bunch of money they were going to invest into healthcare. And they wanted to, they wanted everybody to model themselves after the German style of medical education, which Hopkins was the first German style medical school in the United States. So they hired this guy, Abraham Flexner, in something like 1909, something like that. And he went around to every single medical education school. It could have been chiropractics, uh, Chinese medicine, whatever, allopathic medicine, everything under the sun. Homeopathic medicine was a big one. And they were, they were going to dump money into those institutions that were best styled after Hopkins. And so as a result, not only the midwifery practices, but all of the chiropractics, all of the homeopathics, everything um, kind of fell apart in in some regard because they weren't being, um, they didn't get this influx of philanthropic dollars, philanthropic dollars from the Rockefellers and Carnegie's. And so, um, so I, I don't think this is new. I think this is an extension of what's been happening for, for many, many years. And I I do think that you're right. I think that a lot of these other uh, medical modalities like naturopathic medicine and Chinese medicine, in spite of this history, have continued to rise because they they work for a lot of people. So I don't think they're going away anytime soon, but if if they do pose an additional you know ongoing threat to the medical industrial complex, I don't think the MIC is going to go down um, you know lightly. <laughs> no, it's not it's not. It's not. 